Hello. How's our pregnant ghostess? I'm great. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. I was thinking. I don't know. What's there to report? Nothing. Well, now I've taken time to process. And I was thinking about how I was just like, minding my own business, getting ready to record. And I was about to tell you about how my fingertips get like numb when I'm cold. And then, <laughs> which is so dumb. Yeah, you had a big concern about your fingertips. <laughs> no, but it's not because that's a circulation issue. And that could be serious. Okay, yes, but like in comparison, like your life is, oh, I just was so happy. And I'm so happy for you. Thanks. But my my pregnancy issues don't take away from your needs either. So I you can tell me about your frozen fingertips still. I'm not going to be like, <laughs> oh, well, if you think that's bad, wait till you get zapped in your butthole. I'll be fine. No, I know. And I know you will hear my medical issues anytime, but I more mean like how mundane and how boring was the thing that people were going to listen to if you had not <laughs> shared that news. <laughs> okay, wait, can I actually tell you that, did I t text you this yesterday? I think I did. That my blood work that was sent off oh, yeah. to figure out the sex of the child. FedEx just never came and picked up any of the blood work that was done at this lab for like two or three weeks over the holidays. So my doctor just called and she was so apologetic, but she was also like pissed because obviously yeah. it was FedEx. It wasn't the lab's fault or my doctor's office fault or anything. It was like the person who came in a couple days ago from FedEx to pick up like their weekly blood thing was like, why is this thing so filled? And that's how they figured it out. So now I have to, I don't even care about waiting. I hate giving blood work, and now I have to do it again. <laughs> oh. My doctor, literally, she was like, do you want me to send someone to your house to collect your blood from you? And I was like, no, I'll just come in. <laughs> I'd rather be, like, laying in the chair and have right. the people around me. In case you faint. <laughs> yeah. We'll have apple juice. Yeah, rather than someone just do it and be like, great, you're done, and then leave, and I'm like, <laughs> on the floor. I realize that they can't give you apple juice if you fainted because you can't have apples. They've tried before when I fainted because I faint like every other time. Wait, I do want to say that what? over the holiday break, I was in my hometown where I grew up and I was walking through Marshalls and I was so, Brian and I check out and I was so oblivious. I was just like, if head down. Not even thinking about anything because there's nothing happening in my brain anymore. There's just empty space. So no processing, no deep thinking, nothing. Just totally zoned out. And I'm like walking down past all of the cashiers and there's someone in line and they're like, excuse me, excuse me. I just assumed they were saying excuse me to one of the cashiers because I was walking by all of them. But then Brian goes, Corinne. And I like look at Brian and he was like pointing to this person. And I was like, hello. And it was a listener. That I met in my hometown, which has never happened before. Her name was Ellen, and she just moved to the area from another part of from St. Johnsbury. But I do want to say I have no idea if she spotted us before, but when we were in Marshalls, we were in the baby section and we bought a blanket. And so I was like, did she know before anyone else that I was pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> like if she actually observed what we were doing. Oh my gosh. Ellen. Shout out to Ellen. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> That's hey. so funny. Yeah. I want to know what baby blanket you got. Oh, gosh. Now it's like you have house stuff that you need to be posting and you have to post all the baby things that you're getting. I had these big plans for like, I'm going to post all of my house stuff. The reality is, is I'm like braless, sweaty in my pajamas doing the housework stuff. So like I don't even take progress pictures or videos or anything. So I feel like once things are finished, people will see things, <laughs> but... I'm not going to be some home influencer, not some home like chronicling all of the projects that I'm doing like I thought I was going to in the beginning. It just, it's too much for me. I will say it does give you a lot of respect for people who do do that because in any regard, like any influencer, like it's so much work. To do something and think about content at the same <laughs> time, like no. There was one time I truly like, you know, like those times where you irrationally get angry for no reason, but like there's just mm -hmm. like certain things that make you angry. So this is like year one or two of our podcast and we were sponsored by ThreadUp and they asked us to do like a social media post. And I had gotten like a couple dresses from ThreadUp and I was like super excited about them. I thought they were beautiful, but it was the first time that I had to do like to my face, like, oh my gosh, I got this dress. I've never been so, so awkward, rationally angry 
Like, that's so like I even like I, I feel it <laughs> just remembering yeah. it. like and I was like this is so unnatural I hate this so much I look stupid <laughs> like what do I say I feel the exact same way it really takes people getting over this like mental hurdle to be able to put themselves in front of a camera and share things like that especially recommendations in the world that we live in too where it's like like even on TikTok like it's always this person's eligible for a commission TikTok shop like anyone can do it but it's hard and it's also for some reason it's embarrassing and it shouldn't be but it feels embarrassing when you're doing it i'm not cut out for it this is why <laughs> i am cut out for the life of a ghost i excel when no one can see me i mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. am great at pulling pranks at scaring people like i think i was born to be a ghost okay wait i have an idea Okay. You have five months to get really good at astral projection so that you can come and visit my child whenever you want. Your baby's growing up and like looking up in the ceiling and it's just me like <laughs> hovering over them. <laughs> Wait, I was dying laughing. My cousin Lainey, she's so funny. Over the holidays when I was with her, she just like, we're out to dinner and she just pulls up her phone and she starts taking a picture of my cousin Kate, like so close up on her face. And she goes, don't worry, it's not of you. And I just thought it was so funny that she said that. And I was like, you have to make this a series. And then she joked about how the first time she meets my child, she's going to be like crying and being like, don't worry, it's not of you. And like taking it like two, two inches from the kid's face. No. Uh, well, I will say, I'll say this here too, just to prep everyone. I will share things about like our life and family and kids and stuff through the podcast. But I also, because I've been online so much and seen so much, I'll just prepare people now that I'm not going to be the parent that probably posts pictures of their child. And that is your choice. So, I'm just telling you now. Before it even comes. But let me know what people think this kid is because I've been taking a lot of votes. I only have one vote for boy. I guess two if Brian is included in that. (laughs) And everyone else is saying a girl. It's the year of the boy, though. If you ask anyone who works in labor and delivery, there's a lot of boys coming out. Really? I guess so. It's been 11 days. It's 11 days of boys. (laughs) (laughs) It could turn around. Come on, girls. Let's go. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, the year of the Barbie movie is over. <laughs> Ken is taking over. Dojo Mojo, what's he call it? Ken's Dojo Mojo Casa House. There you go. Casa House. <laughs> so good. Anywho, we are here not to talk about ghosts, but to talk about aliens. Because there is a pretty famous abduction case that happened 50 years ago, this past October 2023, was the 50-year anniversary of this abduction. And so there's a lot of extra research and interviews and articles that have recently come out about it. So I thought, what a better time to revisit this abduction that we've actually never talked about, but maybe other people have heard, and be scared. <laughs> um. Okay, I'm really excited. Because this is also like a really infamous case, right? It is, yes. It's like arguably one of the more famous slash well-documented cases of alien abduction. I'm so excited because we haven't talked about aliens in so long. I know. We deserve this. Sabrina, this one's for you. (laughs) When I go get my alien pillow, it feels rude not to have. Of course. Yeah, that would be wrong. Here we are. My love has joined us. Have you named it? Uh, My love. (laughs) It's just my love. It's just my love. I'm not great with names. I will take suggestions, but honestly, (laughs) I think when we meet in real life for the first time, I'll know their name. They won't even tell you their name. They'll just telepathically. I'll feel it. Give you. You'll feel it. You'll know it. Oh, I just got like turned on. It's like an all knowing being that comes to you. Wait, sorry. One more baby comment and then I'll stop talking about (laughs) it and talk about aliens. But yesterday... I told Freya, mm-hmm. and she asked if we knew like what we were going to name the child. And I was like, we've been really struggling to agree on something. And I was like, but oddly, the one thing we agreed on was 
Brian and I were going back and forth and he said like, yuck, to like one of the names that I suggested. <laughs> and so I was trying to like rebuttal and I was like, well, I'm not going to name it something like, and then at the exact same time, we both said Xenon. So the only thing Brian and I can agree on and are perfectly in sync and say at the same exact time is what we're not naming the child. And that is Xenon. <laughs> well, there go all my hopes and dreams for my Xenon niece. I know. Xenon was, she was sweet. I mean, Zetus Lapidus. It's a great name. I would love to rewatch that. We should do like a watch party. We always, we always say this and we never do. I know. <laughs> well, we should. Doesn't mean we will. <laughs> yeah, should, should is very different. I also should have more time in the day. I should do so many adult things and I keep putting I them off. There's this one line from one of the Noah Khan songs where he says, I've got dreams, but I can't make myself believe them. And I feel like that's basically our anthem. <laughs> <laughs> um, All righty. Okay. 50 years ago, on the evening of October 11th, 1973, Two men set out on the west bank of the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. Charles Hickson, who was 42, and Calvin Parker, 19, brought with them fishing gear, and they were eager to just have a relaxing evening on the water. It was Calvin's first day on the job at F.B. Walker and Sons Shipyard. And Charles, I, I read somewhere that Charles helped him get the job, but then I also, some of the interviews made it sound like maybe they just met that first day on the job. So I'm not really sure what their relationship to each other was prior to this outing. But basically, Calvin was new in town. This was his first day at work. And Charles was like, hey, let's kind of celebrate your first day and recover from the day. And let's go out fishing. And Calvin's like, well, I don't have any of my fishing gear. And Charles is like, that's okay. You can borrow some of mine. And Charles was a very big fisher. And I guess Calvin thought that this was like one of the nicest things someone could ever do is you Aww. know this like prized fisherman who feels so passionately about fishing in this area too in like, this time to just so without second thought share all of his stuff with calvin so calvin is excited he's feeling very good about this outing and is excited and then also it's good timing because not only was it his first day on the job but calvin's wedding was just a month away so I'm sure there was a lot of stress and anxiety and just like having a quiet moment on the still water would be great. And also like starting a job for the first day, like your first day at a new job, like the amount of yeah. nerves that you have, like how are you going to perform? How are you going to get along with other people? Like your job comes becomes so much of your life that yeah. this is like the best sign that you're going to have a great coworker and it's going to bring you peace. Like it's a good job to have. Right. And it's like when you leave the job on that first day, I feel like you just go over everything. You relive every single moment because you're trying to remember what you're supposed to do for the next day. So yeah. it is nice to just be like, nope, you're done for the day. Like, worry about that tomorrow. You have to clock out. Yes. The first location that they went to was just swarming with bugs. And they're like, okay, well, if we stay here, we're going to get eaten alive. We shouldn't go here. So they head back towards the shipyard and Charles ignores the signs that say posted no trespassing. And Calvin's nervous, but Charles is like, hey, I fish here all the time. Don't worry about it. Like, this is my spot. So they walk down this old kind of rickety pier and they cast their lines and they begin to relax into the evening. But there's no biting happening on the other end of the line. So they're uncertain whether they're going to stay there, but they're still giving it some time seeing if the fish are going to bite. Mm -hmm. The sun is now no longer visible below the horizon, but the glow of the sun crept through the tree line Ooh. and over towards this side of the river. It sounds so pretty. It does sound very beautiful. And there's also where they were. There was, it wasn't super remote. I feel like I'm making it sound like they're in this like little creek. Like there was a big bridge <laughs> to the left of them. The way you painted the picture makes me think of the notebook. And all of a sudden now I'm like thinking romance. And I think that's on my mind because of aliens. I know where this is going. But I feel like I'm listening to like a sexy story. <laughs> yeah, it feels like this swampy little creek. And there's just like two men relaxing in their rowboat. But no, they're standing on this like rickety, dilapidated pier next to a bridge. <laughs> Swampy little slut waiting for her aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Shrek. Uh, 
But still, you know, the setting might not be as beautiful as we're picturing in the moment. But to them, it was sure. it was quite relaxing out on the water. It's peaceful regardless. And it's also like, let's remember, it's Mississippi. Yeah. And even though it's October, they were coming off of summer days that are 100 degrees. And even in October, I literally looked up the weather during this year. I was like, what was the weather in Pascagoula in 1973 in October? Because I was like, what were, were they wearing t-shirts? Like, I just wanted to know. Sure. And it was hot. It was in the 80s during the day and it dipped only to like 68. So it probably was like 68 at 2 a.m. So I'm sure it was, oh. you know, there was some welcome relief felt by them having the coolness come off the water. So the stillness and the solitude of the Pascagoula River in front of them was soon interrupted, but not by fish biting. Instead, there was a strange noise that suddenly and inexplicably surrounded them. It was like this whirring, buzzing, pulsing noise that was coming through the river and basically all over them. I picture it like if you were to hear a helicopter but couldn't see the helicopter above you, oh. kind of like the woo, 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 woo sort of noise. Right, which is ominous. Very. And it's all over. And then the sound... Not only are they hearing this, but they're also starting to notice that there are these blue flashes on the water. So Calvin turns to Charles and he goes, Charlie, we in trouble. You lied to me and we fixing to go to jail. Because he was like, oh, my God, these lights are probably from like a police cruiser because we're trespassing in this shipyard and they're oh. coming to arrest us. I was like, wait, what illegal activity have they been doing? OK, but now I get it. Yeah, yeah. They were trespassing and, and fishing. And who knows if you even needed a fishing license back then and for the river. I don't know. But Calvin surely didn't have one. Maybe Charles did. Right. So they turned back to head down the dock and maybe try to like evade the cops. I don't know. But they notice amongst the twilight sky that there is this object. It's hovering and it's still. It's massive, but it's just two feet from the ground. It's oval in shape. The disc is about 30 to 40 feet in length, and it's 8 to 10 feet tall. So it's kind of skinny. It's very typical of what we see, like the photo depictions. And right, but this is massive. Huge, and it's so close to them. They said it originally it was like 40 feet or so from them. And as they're staring in probably wonder but also terror, I don't even know if it was wonder. I think it was probably just sh sheer panic and terror at that point because you're like what the hell is this you can't really think of anything but they're frozen with fear and they're watching as the ship opens and three figures glide out charles and kelvin are nearly blinded by the light that's emanating from the craft so there were these blue lights going and reflecting off of the water but as these beings and the ship opened, it just gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And they can barely see. Like, they can't even run because, like, they could run off the dock. Like, they have no idea where they are. They just are basically frozen in place, completely blinded. But these creatures make their way towards Calvin and Charles. And as they get closer, the light is a little bit less blinding. And they can start making out what these creatures are, who these figures are. You know what's so wild about this encounter is that Traditionally, when you hear about alien abductions or alien encounters, they're like a blinding light or like something happens in the car and then all of a sudden like they've lost time and then they're back somewhere. Whereas this is yeah. so like the length of time that they are consciously experiencing these beings right. is so different from previous or other stories that we've heard. Totally. It is really interesting because some of the details too, I feel like come up like in the actual abduction on the ship piece that they remember come up in other cases that we've heard too. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on those okay. when we get to them. So the creatures, when they get towards these men, Calvin and Charles, they notice that they don't physically need to walk. Like they have two legs, but they're hovering. They're gliding oh. across ooh, the ground. Ooh. All three of the figures are about six feet tall and they appeared to be almost robotic-like. Like Charles remembers that he didn't even register that these could be aliens. He like truly thought there were robots coming and abducting them because they looked so robotic in their movement oh. and physical appearance. And yet they've resembled humans enough. So it's like if you picture a human and you just draw like the basic outline, like it has feet and legs and a torso and arms and hands and a head. Mm -hmm. But everything about each individual piece is off. 
So their skin is gray, but it's not like the smooth gray or the shiny gray that we sometimes hear associated with when people meet the quote unquote gray aliens, the grays. Instead, they had elephant like skin. So it was like really tough. And their head was super round and bullet shaped almost like it was like really it's kind of like a gumdrop (laughs) head. And then in so many of the photo depictions of them, they had these kind of like spikes coming out of their head around the circum. It's almost like a slug, like slug eyes. Interesting. It also sounds so like animalistic. Yeah. Like they they have this body armor for survival. That's interesting because he had the tough skin and even they didn't say anything about eyes. So maybe those sort of things poking out were the eyes. But their mouths were just like these tiny little slits. So there wasn't much. Great for kissing. Of an opening. Yeah. Mm, Mm. Lovely. Small little slivers. (laughs) Love slivers. In place of their hands were, they were hands, but they were like almost crab claws. So it was a thumb and then just all one large finger on the top. It was like if you welded all of our fingers together and just made this sort of crab claw that was what they had for hands. And then they had a very similar thing for their feet. It was just like two sort of slits mm. for toes. My question is like, and maybe you'll you'll get to that, but like after this experience, were these two men interviewed separately? Like, and they rec- both recalled the physical descriptions of these beings so perfectly. Like, did they both see the exact same thing? Yes. Okay. Charles and Calvin, in this moment, they couldn't do anything but watch. They're completely frozen in fear. They're blinded by that light. And they're along this darkening river in the shipyard that's kind of hard to traverse anyway. And so they stand there and the beings meet them. The beings hold out their little grabby crab claws and they grip their forearms with their alien pinchers. One of the beings grabs Charles's forearm Two of the other beings, because there's three of them in total, grab Calvin. And they don't walk them forward. They just levitate. All five of them are just suddenly floating and levitating over to the ship and get into the ship. This is reiterating my theory, or it's not mine because I didn't come up with it, but a theory about alien abductions that it's like an astral abduction where it's not your physical body, but it's your astral body. Because the way that they're floating, and especially like a lot of the times, like people don't, other observers don't notice anything weird happening, which makes me think that like, if I were an innocent standby, bystander, bystander, and I was like, I saw these like two men fishing, I wouldn't see anything weird happen. I would just see two men in their boat, kind of like, I don't know, seemingly in a trance fishing. Right. They're just like frozen there on the dock with their fishing lines. And you wouldn't notice anything at all, especially with fishing, because like people do stand really still. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That is interesting, especially because we're so connected to our astral bodies. Like when people talk about astral projecting or having near death experiences, it takes people a second to realize that they're not actually in their body because all of our consciousness and every all of our thoughts are like within our astral body. Right. And if they can't move. All they can do is like see what's happening. Like they can't really turn backwards to look and see that their bodies are still there, nor would that be their right. their first thought of something to do because no. they're currently yeah. being abducted by aliens. Turn away from the scary thing that's grabbing you. Right. So once they're at the front of the craft, the creatures inject them, like basically put like a needle in their arms and inject them with what Calvin later would call the go to hell shot. It was almost like a tranquilizer. All of the panic that they had just completely subsided. Calvin remembers being super apathetic. He was like, I was conscious of everything, but I I just didn't really care what happened at this point. I was just completely apathetic. I was just an observer at that point. I am glad it didn't like knock them out. Yeah. Because then it's like... Maybe it should have. Oh, okay. So not only can they not feel their own emotions and fear... But they are now physically paralyzed. So they're no longer paralyzed from just their primal fear, but from this medical intervention. So these beings are placing their frozen, paralyzed bodies onto trays, basically, and like leading them down into these rooms. And the tables that they're placed on are made entirely of glass. They're each in separate rooms from what I could gather from the story. In Calvin's room, he remembers that the creature that had led him into the room 
left the room. And then an object that was about the size of a deck of cards and had this circular shape in the middle, it came down from the ceiling and it moved around him and it made these clicking noises and then it shot back up to the ceiling. And so he said at the time he didn't really register exactly like what this thing could be. But after reflecting on it, he was like, it kind of sounded similar to what we have in MRI machines. So he was curious if it was examining him in that sort of way. Hmm. Charles had a similar thing happen, but this is the thing. Like they described the thing that was examining them differently. So Calvin was like, there was a deck of cards with a circle in the middle, basically. Charles remembers an eyeball appearing and it too was floating. And just like the deck of cards object that Calvin had in his room, the eye began to examine Charles. And Charles and Calvin both said that they remained conscious for the majority of the time. They believe potentially the entire time. And Charles said that he remembers, though he was kept in this paralyzed state, the examination that he experienced was unlike Calvin's because Charles said it was a full body examination. Like he was like, you know, when you go to the doctor and you get like basically insinuating like a prostate exam and things like that, like there was probing involved. Okay, but I feel like I'm continuously just finding ways to like... (laughs) justify the alien's behavior (laughs) well okay because i feel like i personally would love to have and i don't understand why we don't just like have this like every year you get your entire body scanned for everything and i know that you can pay you can pay to do that but it's not like a it's not part of your yearly physical and i feel like the aliens are just doing it because the aliens have better health care than we do in America because they focus on preventative care rather than treating diseases right. after they happen that's all funded. Because I imagine that they also Grow your use, own food, people. <laughs> I imagine they use this equipment on themselves as well. Like this is... Yeah. Yeah. I am curious though, like why them and what they were looking for. It's a good question. Yeah. All right. So Charles is getting... the all of his nooks and crannies checked out. Back in Calvin's room, his examination's done. He mentioned nothing about nooks and crannies. He just said the thing clicked around him and then went back up to the ceiling. But now a smaller alien has entered the room. He, although he's completely paralyzed, he said that he could roll his head. So he's on this glass table and he turns his head just enough towards the creature that he can actually watch her. And he said that he knew it was or he felt like it was female because she presented herself as a woman. And he Mm. said she looked so much like a human woman that if he had been like a little drunk at a bar and he was single, he was like, maybe I would have gone up and hit on her. Like she looked human. She was not like these other like leathery slug like I'm so obsessed. Creatures. Now I have a theory that aliens work with humans like they are humans on the ships. Well, okay, this is the thing that I thought was interesting because he said that her two middle fingers are what indicated to him that she was not actually human because they were much, much longer than a regular humans would be. And it made me think of all of the other abduction cases and just stories that we've heard in our inbox from people who've experienced things. I feel like in so many situations, there's one person who appears to be human, but there's something just off, like just slightly off about them that shows or would suggest that they're not human. So it's like, Hmm. what is happening? Are these different races of aliens working together? Is there some sort of like human alien hybrid also on the ship? And how do I sign up? What are these like human-like aliens roles here? Because there's usually just one of them in all of these stories, which makes it even more confusing. And then like, what's the point? Like, I get that you're trying, I guess, like, oh, if if they see something or someone that looks familiar to them psychologically, they'll feel more comfortable. But you've already put them through such psychological trauma and confusion. Like, at that point, does that really, really do anything? I don't know. True. Because if you really wanted to not make them panic as much, why not have the human looking ones go collect them into the ship? Right. Yeah, great point. Like, I don't know what what the point of these figures are. I would be so good at abductions. Like, hit me <laughs> up. I will be the lure. I will lure people in for you. <laughs> you're like Stefan from SNL and you're like, you get off the ship and you're like, there's a hot new bar <laughs> and I have to take you there. Just follow me. Nothing weird happening here. <laughs> yeah. 
have nothing weird to uh, ask about. Just come follow me. You're like, there's puppies in there. Go, go look. <laughs> Uh, the new cat cafe, it just happens to be floating in this oblong special disc. Here's another question, too, because it's like these two guys are unwilling participants. Like they were abducted. It's yes. like they're not, they yes. don't choose it. There are so no. many people, myself included, who would willingly subject themselves to an abduction. So why not come for us? Maybe it's just you're not in the right place at the right time. Maybe it's completely random. Maybe there's something that already exists within those people that are chosen. Maybe there's like usually just one target and just anyone else who's with them just happens to be also a victim. To- sure. Who knows? Okay. Who knows? I just feel like there's a good amount of people in this world who are yeah. sick like me who would just willingly be like, hey, beam me up. We can do this consensually talk me through the process and if i'm not what you're looking for let me know what you're looking for i'm sure there are people out there who would sign up yeah you're like oh i can refer a friend i know someone yeah. just like that i have the perfect person for you let right. me submit their resume and then there's like a rewards program where like if you refer someone you get a free ride on the spaceship oh that would be sweet <laughs> <laughs> do you think you would actually react positively in the moment because there's so much like fight or flight, like there's so much that we're not in control of in our in how our own animal bodies react. I guess if I was talked through everything that was happening and I was able to like back out, if I was like, actually, hey, I am not comfortable with this, I would totally sign up. Like it's like yeah. a, I almost said science experiment, but I meant like an FDA trial, like a medicine, medical trial, you know? Right. This is reminding me a bit of everything that was just going on a couple weeks ago at the mall in Miami when people were saying that they were seeing these alien beings and how so many people were like, why didn't you get footage or why didn't you do this? And I even had the thought myself of like, would I observe these alien creatures for long enough to realize like maybe they didn't mean any harm and and potentially try to communicate with them? But one of the guys who witnessed it, he made a really good point. He's like, there is no thought process other than, holy shit, we have no clue what's going on. This is beyond any of our comprehension of how we experience the world. You are in total fight or flight. You are so crippled with fear that you cannot logically think of anything in that moment. That's fair. I mean, it totally makes sense why, for the most part, alien encounters go unnoticed and unseen Mm. and that they shield themselves from visibility because of that exact reason right okay well so this alien woman human looking thing you would think that she was there to make kelvin feel more comfortable but not really sure what her purpose was because what she did next definitely did not make kelvin feel comfortable she placed a hand with her giant long middle fingers on his jaw And then she opened his jaw, opened his mouth as far as she could. And then quite forcefully, she placed her right hand into his mouth. She fisted him? And with her fingers, she fisted his mouth. With her fingers, she started scraping her fingers down the back of his throat. And so he starts gagging. And now his mouth is bleeding because he's getting like scraped and roughed up and like can barely breathe. He's like literally getting gagged. And his reaction really startled her. Like, she wasn't expecting him to actually be injured. Like, she recoiled and appeared almost to be worried that he was hurt. So she clearly had no understanding of, like, maybe the air passage and just the delicacy of, like, the tissues in the mouth and throat because she... The delicacy. Mm. It's a delicacy in certain cultures (laughs) of aliens to just (laughs) scrape and then lick the back of humans' throats yuck but she appeared to be really worried and then this he said immediately she took her hand out and then this sound just roared from her throat and he was like if you've ever heard an alligator's mating call it sounded like that it was this like deep vibrating groan i've never heard an alligator's mating call now i'm curious or should we look one up really quick yeah and play it yeah It's like really deep and it's like, oh, yeah. well, I can't do it. 
Uh, nope, can't Actually, get there. it sounds like the Rainforest Cafe, like noises that you hear in the Rainforest Cafe. Yes. Yeah. It does sound like the Rainforest Cafe. And then like, eek. It's like if the grudge were an installation in the Rainforest Cafe. That's <laughs> kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> so it seems like this sound that came from her was actual communication and language, perhaps, because it signaled that original alien creature who would brought Calvin into the ship and into this observation room to return to the room. So this creature like rushed in and he lifted or it lifted Calvin and it carried him back down the hallway out of the ship and back to the banks of the river. So now that he was injured, they were like, holy shit, get rid of the evidence. We botched this one. Dump him back <laughs> where we got him. When Calvin gets dumped, Charles is also there. So both of the men are now returned at like the same time to the shore. They're freaking out. They're confused. They're understandably traumatized from this event. Yeah. And they're both like, what are we supposed to do next? Are we safe? Like, do we tell someone? Okay, so where's the boat? Is the boat in the water still or is it also at the shore? Like I'm sorry, they were never they were never on a boat. So they had just walked to the shore of the river gotcha. and were like at one spot. Okay. It was too buggy. So they walked through the shipyard and were just on gotcha. a like little pier, like a little dock. Yes. That was my fault because I was picturing the notebook. <laughs> <laughs> the first version too, I had to like change my edits because I kept writing boat too, but no, they were <laughs> they were on a dock. I'm also picturing Tiana from Princess and the Frog. That too. too, like scenes from that and the lightning bugs and sh- yes, all those things. It does feel <laughs> reminiscent of that, but that's not what they were experiencing. It's so sick that <laughs> we're talking about an alien abduction and both of us have romance on our mind. <laughs> like, what is going well, on? even you when you were like, I mean, I'd be abducted if they like talk me through it and it's consensual. <laughs> like, there's... I bet a lot of people would say that too. Like that, I guess that yeah. makes sense. I think ever since I've started reading Akatar, A Court of Thorns and Roses, I've just been in like a romance mood. Hey, that's good. And it's maybe it's time to finally watch The Shape of Water. <laughs> that movie. Oh, that's a good idea. I've never seen it. Me neither, because it seemed weird. But now hey, maybe it's let's live live watch that. <laughs> <laughs> live stream we that. We should. It's like this alien amphibian creature and a human woman getting it on. Or so the so it seems via the trailer. Yeah. So obviously, Calvin and Charles were no longer going to continue fishing now that they're back on these banks. Instead, they go right back to Charles's car, and Charles, he, he's shaking, and he grabs a bottle of liquor that he had in there, and he takes a few swigs to help settle his nerves. And oddly, when they opened the car door, which was like a relatively new car, mm-hmm. the glass of the window just shattered. So it was like something that happened. I mean, mm. I'm making an assumption here, but it would appear that something with the vibration and mumble of the craft and whatever kind of energy emanated from the ship, it affected the things around it. And so the glass um, was sensitive, I guess. I'm picturing like there's like some weird energy shift that happened to their bodies. And so when they like went to go open the door, like mm. a jolt of energy shot through their hand oh maybe because we're conductors so yeah right as soon as they touch the metal it's like a poof yeah it could be huh so the men they get inside the car and they begin to drive home and charles is immediately like hey i think we need to tell someone about this i think we need to report what happened there are robots in the sky that are abducting people here in pascagoula authorities should know and calvin's like I wanted a quiet, simple life. And if we tell people, we're going to be the people that were abducted by aliens. And what just happened to us is so traumatizing. Do we really want people to know the details of like what we just experienced? Also, I'm just picturing this is like first day of work gets home. Hey, honey, how was your day? Uh, Where do I start? I got mouth fisted by an alien lady. Didn't know that was my thing. Poor Calvin. I feel I almost feel worse for him. There was just so much new happening with him and like his okay, but wedding was coming up. He was supposed to be excited about that. What about Lady Alien? She didn't mean to mess up and she messed up. I feel bad for her. She could have at least done like a nice, I don't know, like a numbing spray in the back of the throat or whatever. I'm picturing like the first time that I got tips put on my fingers and I like couldn't button my jeans 
And like, I'm imagining she just got a manicure for the first time and she was going to do her normal business, but she didn't know how to use her new fingernails. Oh yeah. And she's like, shit, I knew I shouldn't have gotten tips. (laughs) Her middle fingers aren't actually extra long at all. She just discovered the American snack bugles and stacked a bunch (laughs) of them on her fingers. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) She's like, I've seen kids do this. Throwback. (laughs) All right. But they were going back and forth with each other because Calvin didn't want to be publicly known as an alien abductee. It didn't feel right. But Charles was like, I really do think it's our responsibility to, like, aliens are here and we were just abducted. We're not supposed to tell the rest of the, or at least a couple humans that are in authority positions to, like, potentially do something. Mm -hmm. So they end up from the car calling Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, and they told him that they don't have any division for, for like, alien reportings and basically told him to call the local authorities. So they called the Jackson County Sheriff's Department and reported the incident. The deputies wrote down the details that were described to them, and then they let Charles and Calvin know that they'd submit the police report. It was now officially in, but the police said that they assumed that when they we're getting this information from Calvin and Charles that Calvin and Charles were just super drunk and basically like telling this phony yeah. story that they'd convinced themselves of. Sure. But despite the oddity of the story, Captain Glenn Ryder, at the time he was the captain of the police force, he admitted that when he read the report, he laughed a bunch because he thought it was baloney. <laughs> but he called Charles and Calvin and he was like, hey, I do want to talk to you about this report. Can you come in for a formal interview? And so Charles and Calvin, they went in. But what they didn't know was that the police had already hidden a tape recorder in the interview room, hoping to catch the men in a lie. So the plan was like, go in, talk to them, leave the room, leave Charles and Calvin there together for some time. And on the tape recording, probably get something where they're like coming up with a new detail, right? you know, saying comments like, do you think they believe us? You know, like things that would indicate maybe that they were lying and making it up and trying to get their story straight. I do appreciate that they even entertained conversing with them because I feel like, and I have no like personal knowledge on this, but like, Mm -hmm. I do imagine there are probably a lot of police departments that get calls that are a little bit like out of left field like this. And I bet there's like a protocol to be like, okay, maybe you do like a mental health check or whatnot, but you don't do a full report. So I do appreciate, even though they're trying to like discredit the report, that they are investigating it. Yeah, that's true. Because it would be so easy. I'm sure there's so many reports that just are passed on. And if the people that took in the report to tell their captain, like, I think these guys were super drunk, like, maybe Mm -hmm. it really would just get tossed to the side. Right. But it didn't. And that's good. It's good that they took all these precautions. And so they did the first part of the interview, and then Captain Ryder and the other investigator, they got up and they left the room. Here is the conversation, or part of the conversation that they captured on the tape. Calvin, they were really concerned. Charles, it scared me to death too, son. You can't get over it in a lifetime. Jesus Christ, have mercy. So the men, this is kind of how their conversation goes throughout the time that they were left there alone. They spoke about being concerned for their families, the trauma that they were experiencing like from the event. And they talked more about what happened to them, how scared they were. And at one point, Calvin is pretty upset and he appears to like basically start praying. So there's nothing that would indicate that this is a hoax. Right. Captain Ryder said that when he was listening to the tape, he could just hear the fear oh. in their voices. And from what he could tell, there was no deceit. The very next day, the story of the abduction hit the headlines, and though their identities kind of remained a secret for a second, the Pascagoula alien abduction was now public news. And as soon as UFO enthusiasts and investigators and news reporters heard this, they all showed up to Pascagoula, Mississippi to find out as much as they could about these robot crab-like creatures in the sky. And with it, hundreds of more reports of UFO sightings flooded into the police stations over the next two weeks. Some of them seemed actually credible. One man who was operating a crane at night on his work site reported seeing a large ship floating just above the river. There was also a couple driving over a bridge, and I'm curious if it was the same bridge that was just to the left of Calvin and Charles' right. fishing spot. Interesting. But they were driving over a bridge, and I think it might have been at night. Maybe I'm making up that detail. 
but they were driving over a bridge and they reported also seeing a large vessel with a blue light flying just over the river below. There was another couple who saw a blue light and a gray creature in the water. So it was like one of the creatures was out, like maybe playing in the water. I don't know. Taking a little swim, morning exercise. Taking in the healing properties of running river water. I don't know. But on November 6th, there was also a whole fishing party. So like a group of people who had a sighting, they saw, and this is now like three weeks later, almost four weeks later, there was a fishing party who saw what appeared to be a quite a large and illuminated vessel beneath the water, which went by their boat and this thing actually ran into one of their oars. So then they start to chase it with their motorboat, but then they eventually lose the thing. It was described in one of the articles as like a game of cat and mouse between their boat and whatever was this makes me wonder we have not studied our own waters like bodies of water that much these creatures like i'm picturing almost like hippos like the, that's like the type of skin mm. which are water creatures like what if these are not outer space aliens but like deep ocean water aliens oh my gosh that's an interesting thought especially because their spacecraft does so easily glide in the water and it was never seen high up in the sky. It was always near the water, near the surface, hovering just above. Interesting. So this party, they eventually lose this craft that's underneath the water and then they go immediately to the Coast Guard and they report it to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard then sets out on a boat because they're like, what the fuck? Is there some freaking submarine that's illegally operating in yeah. this river? And they see and experience the same exact thing. So this sort of cat and mouse like chase with this glowing craft beneath the water interacting with the boat and this is the coast guard who's reporting it not just people who you know a lot of the ufo reports that came in over those next few weeks a lot of them weren't thought to be credible right but this is the coast guard confirming what all this whole group just experienced clearly these beings need something or are looking for something in this area because Mm. otherwise the attention and like now everyone looking for them If I were them, I'd be like, okay, time to get out of here, like move on to the next place. But it feels like they have a mission and a a reason to be there. And I wonder what that was. Right. Because they were there for a full month, at least based on the sightings and reports. And they didn't seem to have much fear of the humans or being seen. Hmm. So there were multiple other sightings. Some of them even happened before Charles and Calvin's story were made public. So clearly there was something in the area. Charles and Calvin agreed after they were interviewed by the police and before it hit the press that they were not going to tell anyone that they were the ones that experienced the abduction. They did the report. Now they were going to live their quiet little lives as peacefully as they could after that traumatic event with their own families and just leave it at that. But the next day at work, news vans were already waiting for them. So their identities somehow had been leaked within a second. Oh, no. Two of the people who came in within the first 36 hours of this being public knowledge were ufologist Dr. J. Allen Hynek and Dr. James Harder. Hynek had apparently worked on some really big cases, like UFO cases for the U.S. Air Force, Project Blue Book. And so these researchers, they got Calvin and Charles to agree to be hypnotized, which I'm not sure if all... I read that they were hypnotized three times. I'm not sure if all three times were from the same people. Or if these were just separate cases where they just agreed to be hypnotized by different researchers and ufologists right. or law enforcement. This reminds me a lot of the the three women. Yes. Who were, I thought about that a lot yeah. while I was researching this that you covered yeah. a year or two ago. Lisa. Oh, I'm blanking on their names. But there was like three women who were abducted. And this is like a pretty famous case. And they, yeah, they were all hypnotized to, let me look. Um Because it was, none of them were drinking. They'd gone out for one of their birthdays and they Mm -hmm. were all in a car driving back home together from the restaurant. They went to it like 5 p.m. or something. Oh, I think it was like the Mona Stafford, Elaine Thomas, Louise Smith in Stanford, Mm -hmm. Kentucky. That was the abduction we covered. Right. And in that abduction, some of them had really wild physical things that happened to them. Like different reactions and... Like the one where the birds and like animals were really terrified of her afterwards. Yeah. 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 To my knowledge, Charles and Calvin didn't have any reactions like this. Okay. That's good. It also sounds like because they, to their knowledge, were conscious the entire time that they were in the aircraft. It sounds like potentially if certain things hadn't happened, like if Calvin hadn't been injured, maybe they would have been in there a lot longer and then who knows what would have, what experiments would have happened. Yeah. 
But Calvin and Charles, they underwent hypnosis three different times. They did voice stress tests. They even at one point did a polygraph test and they passed. So these two men underwent a bunch of things with people just trying to like investigate and see if there was credibility to their story. And they just, they passed every single thing. But they would never live in peace in Pascagoula with their identities known. Charles did not care as much, but Calvin lost a number of jobs after reporters continued to show up at his work. So he'd get a new job. Within a few weeks, reporters would find out where he was working. They would relentlessly show up, ask for interviews, and he would lose his job. So he decided he was going to change his identity, and he started going by Randy. So Calvin was now Randy. Every time reporters found him, even as Randy, he would pack up his whole family, and he would just move. So over and over again, their family, they were basically like on the run because he did not want the story. It interfered with their livelihood. Like he couldn't keep a job if he stayed put as he was. I mean, that breaks my heart. And it's also like, I feel like there should be a government like witness protection situation for these people so that they can at least restart their life and not have to continuously do it over and over. Like it's, yeah, it's traumatizing. For those who want it. Yeah. Right. But like this guy, clearly he doesn't want to be continuously now like moving his family i can't imagine and even being the kids like that's not a life you want maybe there is some sort of assistance program like that true maybe because you always hear like the conspiracy theories where people report seeing a something on the top of mountain or whatever and then they go missing it's like maybe they're not dead maybe they're just their identities were changed to protect them from maybe like another group that was looking to who knows i'm getting lost in the sauce here but that happened a long time ago yeah these men calvin and charles they were abducted they were inspected they were probed by aliens but one of the more traumatic parts of their abduction story was the constant stalking of the media to talk about their abduction yeah some of their friends didn't believe them. Some of their relatives didn't believe them. And at one point, Calvin's soon-to-be father-in-law, so his fiance's dad, basically showed not as much support for their marriage and was questioning whether mm. his daughter should go through with marrying Calvin. But his father-in-law actually later apologized and said, son, I owe you an apology. I didn't believe you when this happened, but I've seen something since, and I believe it. There's no doubt in my mind that this happened to you. So I have no idea what this man saw, but it completely yeah, changed from him being like, this guy's phony baloney. My daughter shouldn't marry him. He seems like he's going to have a chaotic life to yeah. being like, holy shit, aliens are real and people are being abducted. I was thinking about this recently because you and I have a very specific approach to conversing about the paranormal, about aliens, about all types of supernatural, extraterrestrial things where we are so open to believing and we we have both kind of like not even like out loud verbalized it, but like we are under the impression that who are we to question someone's reality? If someone says they yeah. experienced something, then we want to believe it and also fully understand it and acknowledge that like we don't know everything that's out there. We don't no. have the ability to confirm like this story. Like, for example, we can't say it didn't happen. We weren't there. We can't say it did happen but like this is real and it was real for these two men it was their experience so who are we to say otherwise and right i think sometimes that can like people who come to listen to our podcast i've noticed there are certain people like they believe anything it's like well why not we appreciate the wonder that comes with different stories and i think that we also have this belief of like well if we are open enough to the ever-changing landscape or understanding of what this life even is, we're going to adapt a little bit better. And yeah, there is some peace and serenity and kind of like having your blinders on and being like, no, this is exactly how life is. La 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 la. I'm never going to believe any of this stuff. But the people who have sometimes more trauma associated with these types of events and have a harder time coping because your world gets, your worldviews are shattered. Like everything you thought to be true is no longer true. Like you have no understanding of life and who you are and you get into this like existential dread sometimes. Yeah. It hits those people harder, right? Because they've never allowed themselves to wonder and go down that thought process. It doesn't mean that you and I live every single day being like, there are crab like alien creatures coming for you and the government's poisoning your soil. And (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I believe that, but you know, (laughs) in private, 
with my microphone in front of my face. <laughs> so not so private. But yeah, to your point, we like to entertain the idea that anything can be possible. And I think if we take a historical approach to this too, if we just look at what people believed in 300 years ago, a thousand years ago, things change. And it is a scientific approach to always question whether something that we think is true is true, right? right. Like that's right. part of the scientific method is trying right. to disprove things all the time and figure out exactly what layers we're missing on top of the information we believe already exists. Right. And also this is a storytelling podcast. This is not a investigative podcast. Like we're not going out into the field to like do a scientific study to prove or disprove something. We're truly just regaling the tales, enjoying them and choosing to believe people and their experiences. Yes. Yeah. Well, and while Calvin and Charles didn't always have everyone believing in them, they knew what happened to them that night. Yeah. Their credibility and their lives were forever changed after that day on the Pascagoula River. And in 2011, Charles passed away. Remember, he was 42 at the time of the abduction back in the 70s. So he was older, much older at this point. So in 2011, Charles passed away. But throughout his life, he continued to be pretty vocal about his experience. So while mm -hmm. Calvin spent decades trying to hide and shy away from what happened to him, Charles would go on talk shows, he would participate in lectures, he would give interviews, and he even published a book in 1983 because he was like, I cannot understand why I was chosen. I can't understand why this happened to me and what they wanted, but I'm determined to let other people know that if they've encountered something similar, they're not alone. No. And we have no answers. We don't know what's going on, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen to you. Wait, that's like the exact sentiment that we just shared. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Charles and us, we saw we saw eye to eye here. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Since Charles is passing, Calvin has decided to take a different approach, and he has started to speak about the abduction again and use his real name. Some 40 years after trying to hide all the details of that night, he, with the encouragement of his wife, has now also written two books about the experience, which I assume for he and Charles, that was a very therapeutic thing yeah, to do sure. as well to like yeah. write down and reflect on what actually happened to them and have it like exist somewhere yeah. that physically exists beyond just in their mind where it's like hard sometimes you want to convince yourself something didn't happen sure but now it does exist it's real it happened to them it's in book form in 2019 a historical marker was placed in lighthouse park along the pascagoula river near the abduction site and when the plaque was unveiled, Calvin said it was one of the happiest moments of his life. It was very emotional because he finally felt accepted and believed and respected. Hmm. The last line of the plaque reads, There are plenty of theories about the occurrence ranging from hoax to hypnagogic reverie, which is like semi-awake dreaming. Mm. For them both to be having the same semi-awake dream is wild. Yeah. Like a group hallucination, basically. That's like you and I both having a dream about a demogorgon penis, but like the all the details of the dream were so different. Like everything else was so different, right. you know? Right. There are plenty of theories about the occurrence ranging from hoax to hypnagogic reverie. I'm probably saying that word wrong. To a true encounter. Regardless, it remains the best documented case of alien abduction, particularly since there's a secret tape involved in not one, but two witnesses. So why these beings were there, we may never know. But for Charles and Calvin, it was an experience that altered their lives forever. They were the victims of the Pascagoula alien abduction. Wow. And that's their experience. So wild. There's also a lot that you can watch online. There's like documentaries and different yeah. interviews that they've they've done. But there's a lot of tapes available where you can watch them actually speak about their experience. Mm, wow. It's one of those things where it's like, there isn't much we can say about it because it is mysterious and there's so many questions like, mm -hmm. why were they there? What did they want? Why these two men? Right. Was it just like right time, wrong like wrong place, right time? I don't know. Like, why? Because no one else seemed to be abducted from what I was right. reading. I mean, maybe there were reports where people are like, oh, I was abducted. But all of the ones that were referenced that appeared to be more credible were just sightings of the craft. So yeah. I do wonder... Kind of like what you're saying, like right place, wrong time for them. Yeah. If it was just the aliens acting on impulse, it was chance. Right. It was like, look around. No one else is here. The river is quiet. These two men are completely alone in this like abandoned shipyard because no one's working here right now. And I've always wanted to scratch the esophagus of a man before. So 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were searching for the voice box or something because we sound so different from them. It's like Ursula. They're trying to steal our voices. Right. I have no clue why. But number one, they had stuff to be able to examine them. And to your point, maybe it's because they use it on themselves as part of like a a health preventative measure or, or what have you. But based on the kind of panic and quick dumping of Calvin and Charles, the second one thing went a little bit different from what they these creatures were expecting. It does make me think that this was not a planned right. abduction, that it was in the heat of the moment and they too were maybe semi-panicked about what happened. Or there's some symmetry between these two stories and it's Calvin's first day on the job. What if there's some symmetry here and it's this woman's first day on the job as well? <laughs> And her first day didn't go as well as Calvin's did. No. She made some mistakes. Yeah. I don't know. I do wonder when people experience abductions like this, if they were to see these aliens again and like basically have like a sit down conversation, would they be able to forgive them and understand the aliens for what they did to them? Because obviously it's this traumatic event that affects someone forever. Or is what happened to them so horrific that their mind cannot get to that point of understanding they're just so deeply affected by this experience that it doesn't matter why they just wished it never happened to them? Because I will say there was a comment that I think it was like Charles's daughter might have said that while he did talk a lot about his curiosity as to why he was chosen and like why this happened to him, he never once said, I wish it never happened. Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on the type of person. Like there are a lot of people who have been attacked in any sort of way or abused or hurt and either choose to forgive or decide to never forgive, you know, like it, yeah, it's whatever the healing process is for that person. Right. Yeah. Cause there's certain things that I've been through in my life where I've forgiven people. And then there's other things where I'm like, I will never forgive that person. I have to heal in my own way, but I will never like address it with that person. Right. Wow. Um, Should we talk about the jellyfish UFOs? Yes. Okay. So in 2018, these were just released, but it's a jellyfish UFO from 2018. And I think it was in Iraq and they like were taking, it was like seen through the camera, but they couldn't see it with their eyes. It was only visible via the thermal camera. So right. they couldn't see it any other way. Let's see if I can find a good picture. And even on camera, they couldn't see it without the thermal lens. Right. So it's Which truly, so it was only the thermal image. It's a moving video. Yeah. So basically, the camera locks in. Well, it doesn't even lock in. The camera's following this. They call it like the jellyfish thing because it's like basically this kind of squarish round top that has like these the kind of tentacles, tentacles coming off of yeah. it. But the object is frozen in its state. It doesn't appear to like be wiggling or moving, but it's just moving horizontally across all of the ground. And you can see in the camera that there are like dogs in the background, that there are cars, yeah. like you can see all of this stuff. One of the things that has come up about it was people questioning why the heat signature was changing because as it's moving, you can see that it goes a little bit blacker, which would indicate that it's a lot hotter and then it goes a little bit whiter. But also if you look at the background, people have noted that the thermal temperature of the background is also changing with it. So it seems like there's maybe just like hot pockets it's going through versus like windier spots. Another thing was on the cameras, normally they can lock in. Like you you use the like auto lock and that's how they would basically like shoot or fire, whatever term you want to use. But their system would not lock in on this image. So they could see it through the thermal camera, but it would not lock in place. And when you watch the video of it, as it's moving, like its density seems to like come and go. There's certain places in the video where it like becomes more invisible. And then other times where it's like more three dimensional and like a dark object. And it's very Mm. clearly not a smudge on the lens. Like, well, because the lens moves, it's not always perfectly in the same spot on the lens as it's tracking. Exactly. But it does make me wonder, it makes me think back to the Miami the Miami Mall incident, because the Miami Mall incident, some people were theorizing 
that maybe these beings are always around us and they just exist on a different plane and they observe humans regularly. And so when, because with the Miami mall incident, they were saying that they were these like six to 10 feet tall, almost like shadowy looking figures that were floating and hovering similar to the aliens in this, the Pascagoula alien abduction incident, that they were hovering. They didn't actually have to walk and that they were kind of like glitching in and out. So it almost looked like they were teleporting yeah, in a so way. Weird. And also these aliens in the mall, people were saying who were observing them that they appeared to like look around and like watch everyone react to them, but they didn't do anything. It almost appeared like they were also like, wait, why can everyone see us now? Like we always come to this mall. What the fuck is right. happening? And so I, I saw someone on TikTok and of course I'm not going to be able to reference their name because I don't know how to find the video, but he was wondering if there was some connection maybe between the mall incident and this video that we're seeing where it's like someone was saying that the mall incident could be due to like the solar flares that we've been getting on earth and how it changes the frequency and maybe what we were seeing as these shadowy figures is not the fully formed figure of these aliens but like Hmm. kind of we're almost like glitching into their frequency and seeing a piece of them and then this other man that was theorizing on tiktok about this the jellyfish ufo was saying that perhaps what we're seeing, again, is not like a fully formed yeah. figure. What we're seeing is, he compared it to like a shadow. Like if we hold up our hand and there's light in front of us and we see a shadow on the mm. wall, that shadow is 2D. But we can't, there's no way for us to know the details of the hand that's making that shadow. So he was wondering if the jellyfish was basically like a version of us seeing something that exists in 4D that's beyond our... Oh. our visibility and comprehension and we were basically seeing like but we can see like the shadow it's shadow that's so fascinating yeah this is why i love tiktok because i love to hear <laughs> everybody's theories i mean this is why i also love this stuff because it's like because we don't have answers we can theorize till the day we die like it mm-hmm. we could also say it's like is it an interdimensional thing is it proof that there's like other timelines happening and like an alternate realities that like sometimes bleed into one another like we truly yeah. do not know wild i'm curious what everyone else's theories are what do you think the jellyfish ufo could be and until then this is from our listener maggie we met at one of our shows and maggie showed us some videos and i was like you gotta email us <laughs> maggie sent a bunch of stories in the email so i'm gonna read a couple, and then end with an Area 51 story. Ooh, okay. Maggie has so many encounters. And the subject is videos I showed you last night plus Area 51. She says, hey, Gustices, so nice to meet you both last night. Quite the spooky show. I'm following up to share the spooky videos I showed you last night with some others as well and some emails. There are a couple videos and some background information. The videos in our house that we took was all in a pretty chaotic year, and it was probably the breeding ground for anything paranormal. It was the height of the pandemic. We were engaged and stressed about planning the wedding, as well as getting ready to move cross country. And Mm -hmm. I was a ghost tour guide. I'd also started meditating one to two hours every single day. And my now husband had never experienced anything at the house before I moved in. So I think I probably brought all the spookies with me. Okay. The first video is a video I took outside of our town in Bigfoot country. I was having a very bad mental health day and my husband quite literally said to me, let's go squatching. (gasps) That's love. Oh, the dream words I've never heard, but now (laughs) I wish nothing more. It was a very low effort thing to do. We just get in the car, drive around. Since I used to be a ghost tour guide, I would always take tons of pics and videos and lay in bed late at night going over all of them. So that is what I was doing here. And I wanted a game plan for getting through my funk and that going through lots of videos would at least help. Oddly enough, I captured this and I saw it when I got home. I went back to the same spot a few days later and there was nothing there. So if you want to watch the video, we'll put it into the video as well. Maggie plays it twice, but as you're watching, look into the tree lines. Okay. I remember her showing us this in the meet and greet. hey, that's a squatch. If I've ever seen squatch, that's a freaking squatch in the tree line. Right? 
Okay, and then you'll probably remember this one too because Maggie also showed us another video of a fairy. Oh, oh, I remember this one. This video I'm titling Fairy because everyone we have shown this says the same. It looks like a little fairy. My husband and I are very into the paranormal, but really never put much stock in fairies until we saw this in our home. I don't have much context for it aside from when we looked up what draws fairies. It would make sense that they chose our house because they like live music, sparkly things, gardening, cats, and our home would be a fairy haven. Some famous YouTube channel asked to put it in one of their spooky countdown lists too, so it is somewhere on the web too. And we'll play the video. The video is so wild because it like literally looks like almost like the size of a figurine, right? And that figurine is just like right. moving and leaving a trail behind it. You remember those like little spinny things that you would like wind it up and it would fly up off of the... yes. And then go around. It looks like that. Yeah. It does look like that. But it's moving a lot slower too. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Maggie has sent like tons and tons of videos, but I want to end with the Area 51 story. Okay. My dad worked at Area 51 with top Mm. secret security clearance. That's a number one dad for actually admitting that and letting you know. Seriously. I mean, it's also like, I guess if that's his job, but he can't tell you anything about the job, you know? Yeah. I asked about it when I was young and he just said, oh, I got to see some planes before they were released to paint a picture of my dad's <laughs> character. He is so similar to Red from that 70s show. So much so that when I miss home, I rewatch that show just to think of him. Aww. He gets really grumpy when I tell him that. He's a no frills <laughs> veteran. And if anyone would go to their grave with secrets for our country, it would be my dad. He wants a tattoo that is a list of his priorities, which go like this. One, God. Two, country. Three, family. Because he is easy to mess with, I like to razz him from time to time. So when the alien stuff was coming out in 2021, I said, Dad, the government is saying aliens are real. And my stern, by the book, Dad, looked at me and said, Maggie, the government has known that aliens existed for a long time. (laughs) That's right, because when we hear about something, that means it's 50 years have passed since they first talked about it. Right. And I love that he's like, finally, like, yes, of course. I just haven't told you that because I'm not allowed to with my job. Mm -hmm. I, up until that point, did not believe it. But hearing my dad say it, I became a believer right there. Since then, he has shown slight inklings that he knows a lot more than he has let on over the years. I'll tell him about a book about UFOs I'm reading, and he'll mention that he's already read it. I also Mm remember that in my childhood, my mom mentioned something about him taking a daily flight into the base which I've since learned was for those going to section S4 that Bob Lazar was at. I asked him about if he was at S4, and I don't think he was anticipating that I would remember that tiny detail and connect the dots. I don't know that he was in some high up position doing the reverse engineering, but more that his position was more technical. And my impression is that he didn't have much direct contact with the big secrets, but maybe I'm wrong. It seems that his strategy is not to evade my questions, but rather to give me boring answers. I know my dad so well, and I know there's more behind what he is saying. He does hold fast that Bob Lazar is and always has been the real deal. He was there right after him. And famously, Bob had a lot of stuff come out about him that put him in a very bad light. My dad said that Bob was used as an example to them of what could happen if they broke protocol. The further along we get in disclosure, the more tiny nuggets of truth my dad has been doling out. I also had a dream and have had quite a few psychic dreams. And after his Area 51 assignment, he was supposed to transfer somewhere else, but he felt personally or morally uncomfortable with it. I asked him if anything Mm. like that had happened. And he said he was supposed to go to a remote assignment to Alaska, but turned it down because there was a lot of family stuff going on at the time. Now there are rumblings of an underground pyramid in Alaska, and I can't help but wonder if it's related. Mm. Anyway. Happy to answer any questions or provide more context if needed. Hope you all continue to have safe and spooky travels, Maggie. I just want to know, like, why the secrets? But I feel like even they don't know answers to it. Like, I feel like there's a lot of secrets and I think they remain secrets because there isn't a clear answer. They don't want to cause panic. 
Right. It's like, I, I don't know. I feel like what I come up with in my own mind is going to be worse than what's actually happening. Right. <laughs> you and I especially. I just want aliens to like, come tell us. Because our government's not going to. <laughs> you have to come tell us. Okay, okay. This is a good question. If there was a bulletin, I don't know where it's posted, posted somewhere in the universe, and it's like, sign up here, fill out this application with your medical information to sign up for a alien abduction trial. Who would do it? I would. For free or do you get money? Because normally when you participate in medical trials, you get paid. I'm going to say for free. (laughs) Oh, man. I'd participate as a scout. You know, like I'd go on the street with the clipboard and be like, are you interested in being abducted Mm. by aliens? Sign up here and you might be picked. Okay. I'll be the first name on the list. I don't even care about the abduction part. I just want to know. It's like, well, where do you live? Why do you come here? Right. What's wrong with us? (laughs) I mean, a lot of things. A lot of things. What's wrong with them too? Like, do they need something from us? No, I think we're just the zoo. Yeah. I also like the theory that they are us because who would be more obsessed with us than ourselves? Like Than us. That I think is very fascinating. The aliens we see are all just archaeologists of the future. Yeah. We're coming back to study the way that we used to be. We're just ancient apes. Well, let us know if you'd sign up. And if you have had any encounters with aliens or anything paranormal, please email us to two girls, one ghost podcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to join us on Patreon if you want episodes ad free and one week early, plus bonus episodes every month and live stream campfire stories every Tuesday night. And then also rate and review us on iTunes and tell all of your friends about us. Shout out to Jamie, who edits our video and audio. And thank you to all of you who join us every single week. We love you. We love you. And we will see you you on the other side. side.